Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here. Um, and welcome to uh, our worship service this morning. We always begin by saying, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, what? You are welcome here. Definitely, you are welcome here. If you're a visitor for the first time, uh, welcome. Um, we celebrate Holy Communion today. And that means that uh, if, if you're visiting as well, you are free to come to the table and share communion with us. In fact, we invite you to. Um, besides that, today is also Red Bag Sunday, and that is when we take up our offering, I mean, take up food um, for the, the food um, pantry here in Stratford. And instead of it being outside today because of the rain, it will be uh, in, the, in the downstairs in Lower Packard Hall in the kitchen. And if someone wants to just bring up food, they can bring it up and, uh, and, and just leave it there. And um, I mean, someone will be at the door to come and get the food for you. Also, um, uh, along with that, was I getting ready to say? I had one other thing about about the food, but that can wait. Um, welcome. I think uh, Eric had a, an announcement he wanted to make. Good morning. Uh, as you may have heard rumors, um, somebody's retiring soon in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, who's that? Reverend Rawls is retiring, and uh, we are having a reception on May 26th, his last Sunday. Um, you should, if you're a member, you should have gotten an email and a letter. Um, we'd ask you to RSVP. Uh, it is Memorial Day weekend, so we want you to put it on your calendars, but also we need you to RSVP so we know how many people to expect. Uh, there's also some lots of other options uh, in that letter and email for you to participate. In, um, in us sending Ed off in style and, and Sam as well. So um, if you could attend to that today, that would be great. If you are not a member but would like to participate, please see me after service and I can help you know how to do that. The other thing is um, if you did not yet fill out a name tag to be uh, able to wear a name tag, we're gonna have lanyards and name tags starting next Sunday next Sunday and um, so if, if you'd like the ushers have these slips of paper you would put your first name and your last initial how you would like it on your on your lanyard name tag and just put it in the offering bucket on the way out thank you so much
Thank you, Joshua and Dr. Joe, for centering us this morning. Please join me in this morning's call to worship found in your bulletin or on the screen behind me. Jesus never called us to be good. He called us to follow him. Holy One, we say yes to your call to discipleship. As disciples, we are called to love all people, even our enemies. Holy One, we say yes. As disciples, we are called to forgive as we have been forgiven. Holy One, we will forgive no matter how difficult. We will forgive now and work on forgiving every day. God calls us to walk in love and worship God in spirit and in truth. We respond this morning by saying yes. This morning's hymn of praise is number 517, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Please rise and body your spirit. Holy One, we do not come to invoke your presence. You are already here. You are closer than the breath we just took, and yet as far as the most distant galaxy. We do ask that you would open our eyes, open our ears, and open our hearts, that we may leave here today convinced that we have been in the presence of the living Christ. Paranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come.
Gratitude is such a powerful spiritual discipline. It can impact every aspect of our lives. Besides, there is so much to be grateful for. God has given us so much. God woke you up this morning. God has given you life. Therefore, in a spirit of gratitude, let us joyfully give to God as God has given to us. The ushers will now receive our morning offerings. Thank you. 
to us. We bring to you all we are able just to let you know how grateful we are that we are yours. You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy One, we are so grateful for this day. For once again, this opportunity to not only be together, to fellowship with one another, to renew our bonds, but even more to worship you. You who are the source of all love, who fill us with love and give us the greatest example of all of love in the love that Jesus showed us in his life, his death, and his resurrection. We pray, O oh God, for this your church. We pray for those who are sick, uh, those who have been hospitalized and need your healing touch. We pray for those who have recently lost loved ones and whose hearts need healing. We pray that you would be with them as, as well. We pray with Jesus what you prayed for the church, that this church might be one as you and the Father are one. We pray with Paul uh, that who prayed uh, that we might have the power together with all God's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep and wide is the love of Christ. And to know this love which surpasses understanding, that they may be filled with to the measure of all the fullness of God. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit would be ever present to them in their lives as they continue this journey and I continue mine. We pray that love will always come first in every decision that they make. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory and honor and power uh, in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. That one who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning's scripture readings come from Ephesians. There's a small mistake in the bulletin. I'll be reading from chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and then John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called 
with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above and all and through all and in all. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. I noticed that I had put down as the title of the sermon that following Jesus is not easy. Uh, what I intended to put was that real love is not easy. In fact, it can be one of the hardest things we will ever do in our lives. I, I've often thought to myself that um, you know, if our religion was just a, a, a number of rules that we needed to keep, it would be a whole lot easier than trying to love as we are called to love, as Christ loves us. Which I think is one of the most difficult things that we will ever be asked to do. As I said last week, that it's really impossible to love like this unless you've first known that love for yourselves. But even then, it's difficult. It's the most difficult thing, really, that you will ever do in your life, and yet the most important. I believe it is what Jesus meant when he said, unless, if you want to be my disciple, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's what love calls for. And I think this word is so overused in our, in our world and in our culture. Um, and yet, real love is so rare. Uh, and when real love is practiced, where it is ap apparent, people are drawn to it. They are all drawn to it because we are all hungry for that, just as we were created to be hungry for God. When love is manifest in a congregation, real love, people know it intuitively when they walk into these doors, and they're drawn to it. And this love is, I believe, only manifest in a community, uh, just as we were created to be in community. That's what it means to be created in the image of God because God is a community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This, this community of love that tries to outdo one another in loving each other. But the problem is there's so many counterfeits to love. So many in our world. Now, the world teaches us something far different of what love is. I mean, you can take the most self-centered person in the world, and they can love as the world loves. Uh, a guy can love this woman as long as she meets his needs. Or uh, a person might love a church as long as it meets their needs. You, uh, a person who loves like the world can love their tribe, can love those who agree with them. They might even sing a song or two about uh, teaching the world to sing in perfect harmony. But none of this comes close to the love we are called to. I think that 
The word love can be reduced, biblical love, to one word. And that word is commitment. A commitment to love others as Christ has loved you. A commitment, a commitment to forgive as you have been forgiven. A commitment to be as merciful and compassionate to others as God has been to you. Just like, just look at Paul's beginning. He says we are called to this new life in Ephesians. He's, and in the first few words that he uses are words like humility, gentleness, and patience. All, all traits of love. But then he says this, and this caught me, my attention more than anything. He says, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with doesn't sound a lot like love to me, at least not the love of a couple, a newlywed couple that's fallen in love. Bearing with sounds like putting up with someone else. Uh, but bearing with is important because you know, there's that new love that you have in a new relationship. Um, and people might have that same excitement about when they join a church uh, and get all excited about loving that church, thinking absolutely how wonderful the place is until it isn't. Until you begin to see the imperfections that this place or no place is perfect and never will be. I had a college professor who, used, who told us once, he says, if you are looking for the perfect church, if you ever find it, don't join it. He says, because it won't be perfect anymore. But this is when real love can come forth. Because as I began to love and, and, and am committed to this, I see that love is not a feeling, but a decision. It's a decision that you will make each, in each situation you face and in each person that you encounter. Whether we really like that person or not, that we will love them. That we will love as Paul taught us what love is in 1 Corinthians 13. He said love is patient. Um, it's good that I don't get graded by my wife on these things. Uh, I, I, what first comes to mind is, you know, trying to get somewhere you're supposed to be on time and suddenly the traffic stops. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not proud. After challenging us in the, what we read in Ephesians to live a life worthy of our calling, he says, do it with all humility. Real love is never proud or arrogant. He goes on that love does not dishonor others. In other words, it never puts down other people. Real love doesn't talk about or be critical of someone else when talking to another person about that person. Love always lifts up. Can you imagine what a church would be like or even a marriage would be like if you woke up each day with the thought of what can I do to lift that person up or what can I do to lift these people up that I am coming in contact with rather than criticizing them Paul even says trying to outdo one another in love but let's keep going with 1 Corinthians 13 he goes on to say love is not self-seeking it is not easily angered and what comes to mind is, I'm on Interstate 95 again, but we won't go there. Uh, he says, it keeps no record of wrongs. 
It keeps no record of wrongs. Friends, what if you found out something about someone in this congregation that happened a long time ago? Or something? Would you be willing to forgive as God has already done? Would you be tempted to keep a record of wrongs? Or when somebody's hurt you badly, and you're working through the process of forgiveness because forgiveness is a process. It's not something you do once and it's over. Sometimes you have to work on it and work on it. I mean, when someone says, you know, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget, they haven't yet forgiven. Because the psalmist says that when God forgives us, he separates the things we've done wrong as far as the east is from the west as far apart as they can possibly be. We keep attempting to forgive someone who hurts us until it's like, it's like we come to the point that we do forget. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Paul goes on, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. If you're truly loving, you will strive for what is right and what is fair for all people. Just as Jesus included all those who were hated and looked down upon in society, you will speak out for those who can't speak for themselves. As Paul goes on to say, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres. When I think of the word perseverance, I think of those in our congregation who have been married 40, maybe 50 years. I think of the men that I've known in this church through the years who took care of their wives for a decade or more when their wives were declining from a debilitating disease. And I look at those. One person was asked one time who was constantly taking care of his wife, was asked, you know, isn't this hard? And he said, no, I see it as a privilege. That's, I think, the real, a real picture of what love is. It's the personification of love. And friends, if we took the covenants we make in church seriously, it wouldn't be that different from a marriage. We make promises to each other to walk together. I mean, I think so many people will walk into a church somewhat like a consumer. Uh, a consumer looks for the right product, one that will suit their needs. When the church no longer meets those needs, they move on. Some have even come to me and said, it wasn't you, but someone did something or whatever. I've had people say that when they left the church, I just couldn't, I couldn't agree with what you were doing with the budget. Uh, or someone say, the church simply is no longer meeting my needs. And friends, I want to tell them, you weren't called into the church to have it meet your needs. You were called into this community to meet the needs of each other. Love will always be a commitment and it must always come first, irregardless. And when it succeeds, when love does come first, Paul ends by saying love never ends. But I like the new revised translation better. It says, love never fails. Never fails. I think a church that perseveres in love will never, never go out of business. There will always be a uniqueness, a gut feeling for seekers coming in for the first time that something very rare and real is going on here. Something they may have never known before. 
They will know that you are really authentic followers. As our scripture said, by this they shall know that you belong to me. And I believe, but I believe, and in the months and years ahead, that your love for each other will be tested and your unity will be tried. And this will be the time when you will be confronted with the most important decision that you will ever make. And that is, will love come first? Let me just clarify here. When Paul speaks of, he goes on to say, strive for the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. That unity that he is talking about is not uniformity. In fact, the Holy Spirit is always manifest in diversity. Diversity of races, diversity of ideas and ideals, a diversity of ages, a diversity of our own experiences, whether it be our experience in life or our faith experience. There will even be a diversity of beliefs. The key is, can we keep this unity while acknowledging our differences? Can we love each other when our ideals and our faith experiences run contrary? Unity and love does not mean that we keep our mouths shut in order to keep the peace. One thing I've realized about all churches, <clears throat> excuse me for a second, every church I've ever served and I know about in other churches is we don't like conflict. We really don't. Um, and uh, in fact, I think we're afraid of it. Afraid of what it might do to the church, afraid of what it might do to our relationships. And sometimes I think we just feel that, let's just get along. After all, isn't that what love is? No. Love is speaking the truth in love to each other. And if you don't do that, I have found in almost every church that I've been a, a, a part of or a known of, that bullies can come in. Bullies can come in and take over a church when everyone simply wants to get along. Love does not mean accommodating bullies. If someone comes in who is abusive and hurtful to others and always uh, making threats that if he doesn't or she doesn't get their way, they'll leave, you need to stand up to them. As Jesus would have done if someone would have done something to one of his little ones. Love is not being a doormat. That goes for marriages as well. If your husband is abusive, the most loving thing you can do for him is get out. Real love is the ability to speak what you believe, whether people will agree with you or not, whether it makes them angry or not, and the ability to listen to others, whether you agree with them or not, or whether what they say makes you angry or not. We are to speak the truth in love, not bash one another. If someone is different or feels differently than we do, but when there are differences that we can agree to disagree. But when there are differences, and can you agree to disagree? Can you choose to love when you don't get your way? What will come first, your opinions or love? Will you commit yourselves that love comes first when you have very strong differences, when you are at far different ideas of what direction your ch our church needs to go in in the future? Will love come first 
when uh, the person you felt should be the pastor of the church is not. Or when things get hard as they did during um, COVID and you wanna turn on each other and blame each other and your fuses are short from all that you've been, the stress you've been going through. It's in those hard times that Paul is saying, can you bear with one another in love? I've often thought of how much Jesus bears with me I am a sinner who has often strayed, often wanted to walk away, uh, often angry at God, uh, often not loving at all. But he never has given up on me. Even when I've given up on myself. Last of all, let me just finish with some words from Anne Lamont who said, when love seems to fail, or has failed, there is only one antidote left, and that is to forgive. Amen. Would you join me now, and, but remain seated for this one as we sing our communion hymn, In Remembrance of Me, hymn number 403. at the table. There are no conditions you must meet. In fact, there is a chair with your name on it. The spirit of love has filled this place. Joy is springing forth. We simply invite you to come and be a part of it, and we ask you to come humbly. Would you join me in the confession found in your bulletins? Holy God, we believe that you love us, but we are not sure if that is enough or that even matters. You delivered your ancient people from slavery to freedom, but we feel bound up by so many ways. Our worries and anxieties cripple us. We don't believe we are interest you're interested in the everyday circumstances of our lives. We look for healing and wholeness, void of your help. We look for peace, apart from coming to you and always end up disappointed. Forgive us, patient and waiting God, 
Forgive us for not trusting that you care about each situation. Forgive us for not believing that you want to set us free from all that entangles and burdens us. Friends, God loves us and forgives us. We can come to this table assured that we have as much right to be here as anyone because it is Christ who has invited us. It is Christ who meets us here to offer us grace and to make us whole. and teachers to remind us of your word. You sent Jesus to teach and to love us and to bring us back to you. Be known to us now through the gift of your Holy Spirit in the breaking of the bread and in the drinking of the cup. Give us the hope of faith. Open our eyes that we might recognize you in the new life all around us. Give us and give us to know your resurrection. United in spirit with people in all times and places, we pray, amen. You may be seated. We remember that on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took bread and broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we give you this bread.
ministering to you in Christ's name, I give you this cup. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your praise in our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 422, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. Please rise in body and spirit and join in the singing. Thank you. 
please join me in the song of Simeon. Holy One, now let your servant depart in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared for all people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but as I give. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Jesus. And may his peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in him until we meet again. Amen.
Jamie, we'll see you downstairs.